Welcome to Diagnosis and Treatment of Binocular Anomalies, a practical approach. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Cooper, and hopefully I will walk you through the common eye muscle anomalies that we see and help you develop a better approach than you had before you came in here. Uh, my website is coopereyecare.com, and the back of it is a page on publications. And there's a host of articles there that uh, will support the information that we're presenting today uh, and give you a firmer foundation if you're interested. Uh, I have a number of uh, financial disclosures to reveal. The first one is the HTS or Home Therapy System in Computer with Optics. I'm both a developer and I receive royalties. And I obviously believe in it because I was the person to develop it. Magic Leap, a multi-billion dollar funded company from Google and many other big financial sources, which is developing augmented uh, virtual reality, which um, in my belief is going to be the next Apple, Google, Facebook all rolled up into one. Treehouse, which uh, has created um, standalone myopia control, natural view contact lenses, which is approved for presbyopia, but is the perfect design for myopia control. So the only one that will really be delved into this lecture is HTS in computer orthoptics. I believe that accommodative virgins problems are extremely important and almost put aside today in today's optometric curriculums, and in our offices. If we take a look at the most common pro problems in our office, they're clearly refractive errors. Myopia being number one, presbyopia being number two, and hyperopia being number three. Once we eliminate the seen problems, the second most important reason why patients come to visit us is on the basis of eye strain, asthenopia, and dry eyes. And we need to differentiate dry eyes from asthenopic complaints that are associated with accommodative virgins. Too often, it's assumed that all of the symptoms that come from computer vision syndromes, reading and close work are related to dry eyes or accommodative problems. There is clearly a strong virgin component to that, and we're going to talk about that today. These problems are so common that 60% of all computer workers complain about asthenopia. 5% of the population have symptomatic convergence insufficiency. That means one out of 20 patients who are walking in your office most likely have a binocular problem that is crying or needs some form or type of treatment. 10% of the population have symptoms from uncorrected accommodative convergence errors. Therefore, that not only are they common, but they're increasing because kids are spending much more time on close activities related to computers, their iPads, their smartphones, etc. More kids are going to college, more kids are going to grad school, more people are spending more time on computer, and virtual reality is going to be the next big wave, and it's going to be associated with more asthenopia and more motion sickness than previous types of forms of displays with computers. Why does this seem to happen? Because virtual reality dissociates accommodation from virgins, is dissociated from virgins. They're in two different planes. Accommodation is where the presentation is, Vergence is where the object appears to be. And in my experience, it seems like most doctors seem to ignore the complaints of uh, uh, related to vergence related asthenopia. It's easier to prescribe plus because uh, it's A, sells a pair of glasses, and B, is an easy way out. It doesn't require any work, doesn't require much thinking. It's clearly going to work when the patient has an esophoria. It's going to work when the patient has an accommodative lag. It will not work when you have a classical virgins problem, such as a convergence insufficiency, or any other binocular problem that is related to asthenopia. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about when we're here. 
Even the American Optometric Association tends to ignore these types of problems with the so-called 2020 rule, which tells everyone every 20 minutes take a 20-second break. There's no evidence that this works. It ignores the etiology, which is accommodated for virgins in nature, and ignores the fact that we can probably eliminate these problems by instituting some form of therapy to improve accommodation in virgins. So this lecture is going to be very much on the basis of diagnosis of those problems and guiding towards having the doctor diagnose and fix the problem so you can change someone's life. These are practice builders. Practices are built from patients who are enthusiastic about our care, not built by patients who are satisfied with their care. Keep that in mind as we go on. And it's been always the major dictum of my practice. You want enthusiastic patients who are going to go out there and talk about your practice, be it in contact lenses, be it in uh, any other type of thing that you do. Talking about accommodative virgins problems, the first thing we need to do is understand the physiology related to it, the symptoms associated with it, determine the clinical measurements of it, Therefore, make a proper diagnosis and institute proper treatment of it. We're going to walk through each one of these particular areas. Whenever we're looking at binocular findings, we tend to measure two different measurements. One is motor, which is the actual movement of the eyes, the angle of deviation or fusional ability, or sensory, which can be broken down to where it's one, two, and three. Let's first start talking about the sensory findings. We tend to look at stimuli when we put it in front of the eyes as being one of three different types, superimposition, flat fusion, or stereopsis. These are also known as grades one, two, and three of worth. We also measure fusional amplitudes, and we use targets that are either flat fusion or stereoscopic. We cannot use superimposition targets. Superimposition or first degree targets are used to measure the position of the eyes, Fourier's or the objective angle of strabismus. When we look at targets, the targets themselves define the type of fusion that they stimulate. First degree targets have a target presented in front of the right eye and left eye whereby nothing is similar. In this particular case, the head is seen by the left eye, the body is seen by the right eye, the background is suppressed. Otherwise, we would see the head vacillating between the background, which is white, and the head, and we would actually state that this is suppression. So when we actually see this target, we have a situation where the left eye suppresses the background of the right eye, so we see the head, and the right eye suppresses the background of the left eye, so we see the body, and we see the head on top of the body of this particular target. So the eyes actually work with relative suppression. Without suppression, we would be bothered by diplopia all the time. So suppression is not necessarily bad. It's a very functional thing. Physiological suppression is extremely helpful to keep the eyes working properly and balanced. With second degree fusion, the targets are exactly similar, they're identical. They're the common fusional targets that we use to measure fusional amplitudes. The line that you have in your phoropter, single line, is a perfect example of a second degree target. Third degree targets have retinal disparity. Retinal disparity means that there's relative depth, not absolute, relative depth. There needs to be two objects so that we can create this disparity. Now, stereoscopic targets are actually done in two different forms. One are considered line stereograms um, or contour stereograms, and these have edges to it that create the stereopsis. If the edges are symmetrically displaced, like the word circles, um, then it's easy to pick up the monocular cues, but if they're displaced like the animals in the lower portion, which is A, B, and C, uh, it's difficult to pick up the monocular cues and they're very good targets. 
Line stereograms do not require fusion. They can be seen in areas where there is diplopia, and thus uh, they can be perceived by small angle strabismics. On the other hand, random dot stereograms, which create their stereopsis by shifting a defined area within the stereogram, have no edges and no absolute borders, and therefore are called global stereopsis. Random dot stereograms require fusion and cannot be appreciated by constant strabismics. Since they have no monocular cues and require bifoveal fixation, they are an excellent screening device for binocularity in your office. Patients should be presented a random dot stereogram to make sure they have adequate binocularity. Generally speaking, if you if you utilize a random dot stereogram that has moderate retinal disparity, that being somewhere around 300 seconds of arc, over 95% of your population should be able to appreciate it if they have normal binocular vision. The second area that we want to talk about is the ability of the eyes to make appropriate virgins types of responses to stimuli. Historically, Virgence has been broken down into tonic, proximal, accommodative, and fusional, and they seem to be added together, and it's called Maddox analysis, which was first described back in the 1800s. Tonic virgins were the eye's position, accommodative occurring from distance to near in this relationship, proximal being related to the psychological belief something being close and it's real and fusional that portion which is maintained because the brain is putting the two images together when we measure fusional amplitudes either using a prism bar or a phoropter what we are normally measuring is what's called fast virgence it's an instantaneous immediate response to a change in virgence disparity as soon as you increase the, the demand from the prism, the eyes make a convergence or divergence movement in regard to it. The faster you move the targets, the lower the fusional amplitudes. The larger the target we use, the larger the fusional amplitudes. So fusional amplitudes are directly related to the size of the target and to the speed of testing its immediate response in quickly fatigue. It's what we measure in our phoropter when we look at binocular findings. When we add prism to the eyes, the initial response of the eyes is to make a convergence movement without a change of accommodation. So, convergence moves in from base out prism and accommodation is readjusted to maintain itself at the plane of the regard. So the two systems are at a different plane, convergence being closer and accommodation being further back. In virtual reality types of situation, this is exactly what is created by the stimuli. It actually is like measuring prism. We are adding a convergence disparity between that and accommodation. Accommodation is at the plane of regard, virgence is closer in or further back, depending on how the disparity is being created. This can create asthenopian patients who have poor accommodative virgence ability. There are other factors that do it, plus motion sickness, etc., but it is a major concern in the development of virtual reality, particularly the type that is augmented in nature. If we keep adding prism, we will eventually reach a point where it, the target will begin to blur. This is the limit of fusional convergence of, of either positive or negative. Positive being based out prism, negative being based in. Once we reach the point that we are using all of our accommodative Virgence, then more prism that is added will, will cause a blur because we're moving accommodation. We will eventually reach the maximum amount of prism that the eyes can do using both accommodative and fusional 
convergence, an additional prism will result of diplopia. Diplopia occurs where you have the limit of a combinatorial divergence and fusional divergence, and the target will instantaneously become clear again. As we know, we reduce the amount of prism until the prism is at a point where we regain fusion or the recovery point. So the recovery point is really a representation of voluntary vergence. Patients who have good recovery points usually have strong vergence systems. So we're measuring the potential to maintain fusion and the ability to regain fusion, which is voluntary vergence. We use prism bars with any patient who has suspect of having a strabismus or any child who is under the age of 10 years of age. The advantage of prism bars is you can see the patient's eyes. They're quick, they're fast, they feel good. And it's important to ask the patient how they feel when they're testing. Remember, dry eyes are associated with a burning and sandy feeling, where accommodative invergence problems are associated with pain, discomfort, headaches. That's not a sign of a dry eye. Maddox is basically a method where each one of these are additive to each other. So they're kind of separated. Graphical analysis is a method of looking at binocular vision. It takes into account both the width of clear binocular vision, and it also takes in the relationship of accommodative vergence, which is the ACA relationship, and the position of Fourier. Shared's criteria has been used to be able to determine the amount of prism two times the phoria minus the demand divided by three is the amount of prism that is prescribed. So therefore, if, if a patient has 10 of exo and an imposing vergence of 10 diopters, it would be two times 10 or 20 minus 10, which is 10 divided by three or three diopters of base in prism. And this actually works pretty well. Uh, but all of this, all of this does not account for the amount of time that's spent at near an individual's pain threshold or the amount of effort. And that's important. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons people tend to drop out doing this type of test because the correlation is not perfect in there. I think one of the most important things is that when you measure fusional amplitudes and the measurement of fusional amplitudes with the prism bar takes no more than 10 to 15 seconds at maximum. Looking at the patient's pain threshold is extremely important from that standpoint. Patients who have a convergence excess are patients that have a higher ESO in relationship to the di distance phoria, their ACA re relationship is high, and therefore PLUS is extremely helpful. Where convergence insufficiency are patients who have a larger EXO at near, the ACA ratio is low, therefore plus lenses, minus lenses don't have much of an impact on them. Prism might help, or the patient needs to build up their fusional ability to be able to handle it. There are also patients who have normal phorias, but restricted fusional amplitudes, and they have asinopia on it. In that particular case, no prism, no amount of plus is going to have any impact. The only way to take care of these people is to increase their fusional amplitudes with vision therapy. The change in looking at how the fusional system works goes all the way back to the 1890s, which is almost 120 years or 130 years ago. Maddox noted that when you put a prism in front of a patient and you had them wear it for a little period of time, base out prism, the patient landed up having an esophoria immediately after wearing the glasses. And in the 1950s, Ogle demonstrated that patients who have a vertical deviation develop adaptation. He, he measured fixation disparity of a patient with a 5-diopter left hyperphoria and then afterwards, he corrected two diopters of it, redid the fixation disparity, and then they 
had a patient wear four diopters of prism. After wearing the prism, with the prism on, they measured fixation disparity and demonstrated that the patient had complete adaptation to the prism. This is the reason why some patients eat a prism and it's contraindicated to eliminate their problem because they have a process that's known as slow virgence in which adaptation overtakes the original deviation. Later on in the 1950s, Daryl Carter was in the clinic at University of California, Berkeley, and a student had a patient with a relatively large intermittent vertical deviation. And the patient was basically comfortable without a major head tilt. And like all good people, they wanted to fix this. So they prescribed vertical prism. And the patient got their vertical prism, and they wore it, and they had the patient back. And when the patient came back, they had adapted to the prism and shown with the correction the same amount of prism that they initially had. So what did they do? They increased the prism. Patient came back a couple weeks after wearing the lenses, same thing happened. And they kept this process up and the patient landed up with a significantly large prism distortion secondary to the prism and then started developing asthenopia. And when they took the prism off, the patient had diplopia. The patient had adapted. This asymptomatic patient was now sitting with this large prismatic question and had developed adaptation or had eaten up the prism. This got Carter to thinking a little bit. And he had patients, or actually students, wear horizontal base out prism and found that the patients adapted to the prism. For example, if the person was orthophoric and near without prism and then wore 20 diopters of base out prism for a while, they showed either orthophoria or a little bit of ESO, not a big ESO like the 20 prison diopters. He had these, the students go to sleep without being allowed to fuse when they took off their glasses. And upon waking up, the patients had diplopia, and they had diplopia for a while. They couldn't get it back. To get it back, they put the prism onto the patients and slowly reduced it. So these virgins affected, which lasted throughout sleep, were dependent upon fusion. So therefore, it was believed that this virgins adaptation, which eliminates our Euphoria, decreases our euphoria and is related to adaptation to take the strain off of fast virgins. So fast virgins is what we measure with a prism bar, what we normally measure in slow vision, slow fusion, which is a feedback mechanism, is uh, responsible for maintaining the eyes in a line position. Patients adapt to prism over a period of time, and as we can see from these graphs, they adapt fairly rapidly. And each patient has a different adaptation response. This is important because it takes the load off of our fast version system. It's probably more important in sustaining binocular vision. It eliminates the need to maintain large disparity versions, and it is a representation of fixation disparity. The most important portion of it is this slow virgin system, which takes the load off of fast virgins, is related to asthenopia or eye strain. So, so far this seems relatively academic in nature. It's not. It's important because slow virgins creates orthophoria. It's the reason why when you do a cover test that you see a small little exo at near and that exo keeps increasing. It's the reason why our patients who have anisometropia adapt to their glasses and don't have problem. It's the reason why our patients can go from contact lenses to glasses and not have any eye strain. It's the reason why we see patients with a large vertical hyperphoria and they don't have any asthenopia. And as we mentioned before, it's the reason for increasing 
of Fourier testing. Patients develop a memory of the virgins of their eyes. You know when you prescribe a pair of glasses, it's bothersome to a patient. That patient needs to develop a memory pattern to that specific glasses to be able to put them on the next day or the day after and not sue asthenopathy for complaints. Patients who have asthenopia have poor virgins adaptation. Let me repeat that again. Asthenopia results from the patients with poor virgins adaptation, not necessarily from the patients who have poor fast virgins. We measure fast virgins with a prism bar. We can see slow virgins from repeated occlusion, or if you occluded the eyes for a period of time, which has often been referred to Marlowe occlusion. Most of us don't have the time to be able to do this, but it is that person who has a real binocular problem, um, a simple way of detecting slow virgins. The control system puts this whole thing together. And note, it is not additive. It's interactive feedback. The system can, if there is a large error, meaning a large Fourier area, we can either use disparity virgins, slow virgins, tonic virgins, ACA ratio, convergence accommodation, convergence ratio, to take a load of, off of either the accommodative system or the virgin system. And we can input in any one of these particular segments to take the load off of a virgin's response, VR, or an accommodative response. Improving disparity virgins comes from vision therapy. Improving slow vir virgins comes from vision therapy. Altering tonic virgins comes from surgery. Altering ACA ratio input comes from the utilization of either of plus lenses on the eyes. A descriptive system to show that it's interactive, dynamic, always acting, to always to try to reduce that virgin's load with the least amount of effort on it. The system, remember, was never really designed to, to work on a two-dimensional object with sustained accommodation and virgins at a particular plane. The accommodative virgin system, like all systems of the body, were designed to work in altering or changing dynamic fields of view. Meaning, we like to accommodate at something close, look at something far, and thus, asthenopia, as we know it, is a result of our modern-day culture. Most common symptoms include diplopia, and we always need to differentiate monocular from binocular. As all of you know, the most common reason for monocular diplopia is actually uncorrected astigmatism. Or actually, it is the real uh, major reason for binocular diplopia. Patients who turn around and say that I see double most often have astigmatism. You need to ask the patient, how are the images separated? If they're right on top of each other, make sure you rule out keratoconus, uh, either regular or irregular astigmatism, or any other reason why you may have distortion or changes in high order aberrations of the eye or low order. True diplopia can have one have three different components: a horizontal, a vertical, or a cyclo deviation. Horizontal and vertical deviations are easy to measure with prism bars. Cyclo deviation with Maddox rods. Cyclo deviations are a real problem because it's difficult or impossible to create any type of correction from a lens or a vision therapy standpoint of a cyclo deviation. They can only really be handled from a surgical standpoint. Patients can complain of blur, and the blur is usually somewhat intermittent, changing. Differentiation from our dry eye patients whose blur is related to blink. Dry eye patients have a different blur than patients with asthenopia or, or accommodative virgins problems. And patients who get asthenopia from our testing are patients who generally have asthenopia. This becomes important because it decreases performance, may have some educational impact. You know, and you're going to get kids or adults who will just 
overcome their binocular problem, take some aspirin, live with their headaches, and do quite well. So there is not a direct correlation between asthenopia and its impact on performance. When a patient has diplopia, make sure that you ask the questions to determine where it's occurring, distance or near. Does it occur to when the patient looks to the left, when they're looking to the right? Does it occur when they're looking up or down? Is it more prevalent in the morning? Is it more prevalent in the afternoon or evening? You must keep in mind that uh, those that are really more time variable, you have to look at pathological situations like myasthenia. Is it constant or is it intermittent? Constant types of strabismics are more helped out by the utilization of PRISM. And we need to verify that with cover testing. Make sure when you're doing your cover testing that you have long, prolonged covering, not a rapid covering, because you want to uncover that slow virgins, that virgins adaptation. If patient is has no deviation in distance near, and no deviation on EOMs. There's clearly no need to do any types of motor fields on that particular patient. The number one reason why people have problems are asthenopia or eye strain when they're on CRTs, secondary headaches. The headaches clearly are associated with reading or close work. Patients who get eye strain headaches will tell you that it comes right after or during the process of reading or close work. Those that are related to tension occur after the task. Patients who have tension types of the headaches tend to get their headaches at the after they're done with the task, the reading, close work, or computers, or more commonly on the days off. Where patients who get eye strain related to near work, it's occurring with the reading. A child will tell you, I get this in the afternoon. The more I read, the more intense my headache is. Or they try to avoid it by falling asleep when they're reading. Or they give up in being able to maintain clear binocular vision and they blur. Or they give up their virgins and get diplopia. It's interesting that many of these particular kids have motion in car sickness. So as we mentioned before, headaches associated with near work, dull aching, frontal occipital, associated directly with near work, end of the day, they don't, they don't usually wake up with them. Some of them they do, but it's, it's relatively rare. Aspirin will relieve them. They are, they are not vascular in nature. Uh, and they have this real relationship with what they're doing with their eyes. We often ask a patient, how long can you read or work comfortable? This is part of, if you get headaches, when do you get the headaches? What makes them go away? You need to think at most asthenopia, it's a little bit like the person with chronic back pain. When it's gone or not bothering them too much, they don't tell you about it. A young child will have double vision and not tell their parent. It's almost routine when you do a near point of convergence in a child who has a gross convergence insufficiency. The guy goes out and if you say to that kid, do you ever see double? They'll oftentimes tell you, oh, all the time when I read, the parent's mouth will open up. And when you, um, the parent will then turn around and say to their child, how come you don't, you never told me? The answer is almost universal. It's always because you never ask. So if you always get headaches and always get eye strain, you don't tend to report them. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the convergence insufficiency clinical trial was done and it evaluated binocular and accommodative problems and they developed a symptom a symptom survey that's really really good and it doesn't pick up everything but it's very very good and it has uh, the normal number on it from a score standpoint anything under uh, anything over 21 causes symptom this is the convergence uh, insufficiency um, symptom survey. It's made up of 15 questions. The child or adult answers it never and frequently, sometimes fairly often or always. Score it up the highest it can be. Uh, you score up each one of the columns, score up the total numbers. Highest is 60. Uh, the mean for your child is around 14. Um, adults are a little bit higher. 
21 it seems to be a very good cutoff of being comfortable or not. Keep in mind, though, that if you use this symptom survey, which we do all the time, okay, it's part of our intake on kids, and it's very, very good for anyone who seems to have any type of acidopia uh, problem because you get a score, and the parents see the score, and then they, they know what the child has before you interpose either plus lenses, prism, vision therapy, whatever you're going to do for the kids, you have a baseline. So you can talk about the changes that occur afterwards. And um, the problem with this is if you have a child who has one symptom being headaches all the time or diplopia all the time, it's insensitive to pick it up. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's, but it's very helpful. So what, you know, what you really want to do is make the diagnosis by history, confirm your findings with uh, your examination, and offer a treatment that will eliminate these types of problems. To do this, you really don't need anything expensive. You need a, a occluder, which you have, horizontal and vertical prism bars, uh, a red lens, and uh, a random dot stereogram, and a pair of plus minus two flippers. Not very much at all. So these are important because they cause symptoms, they affect reading, they interfere with productivity. And our goal of optometrists is to maximize performance of our patients. If it's due to the fact of eliminating glaucoma so that they have a normal visual fields, if it's uh, to provide uh, low vision devices in patients who have macular degeneration or clear vision with glasses, or LASIK treatment, or contact lenses, or cataract surgery. It doesn't make any difference. Patients want to perform better, and it's our job to diagnose the problems and fix it. So as we mentioned before, the, the diagnosis and testing um, can be done either by yourself, or there's no reason why you can't train a technician to do this for you. It only takes two minutes a period of time. Um, you need to do be able to do a good, careful cover test, uh, versions, a near point of convergence, and when doing a near point of convergence, repeat it a couple times. Um, cover testing, make sure your occlusion is over the eyes for a couple of seconds before you go to the other eye. Make sure you occlude enough to release some of that slow version so that you can really see it. Measure fusion divergence with a prism bar so that you can see their eyes and you'll be able to know if they're suppressing or not. Your technician should use a random dot stereogram to make sure that they're binocular and use the CIT asinopia questionnaire. If I have a real deviation at distance or near, I do EOMs. If I get any feeling that there is a lack of concomitance, I do a motor fields, which is a measurement of the nine cardinal positions. It's usually a distance to, I don't have a room that's big enough, so I turn the patient's head and do the cover test with it, use a prism bar, I give them the vertical prism, I use the horizontal, and I neutralize it while they hold the fixation spot at near. You can also rapidly, when you look at a patient, when you, you, there is a method called the Kremski method. So whenever I look at a patient who I think may have a strabismus, I make a determination of how large that deviation is. I put a prism or a prism bar in front of it, neutralize the position or equalize it between the two eyes, move the prism bar up and down until that's equalized, and then do a cover test to determine if I'm correct. And after a period of time, you get pretty darn close at looking at an eye and determining how large that deviation is and just putting the prisms in front of it. It takes about two seconds to do that. Prism bar, put it in front of muscle light. Uh, there's a big deal being made about using accommodative targets. Yes, they're a little bit more sensitive, but young kids can't really define blur very well. Even older patients don't define blur very well. The advantage of using the transillumator is twofold. 
I've already used it to do pupils or anything else and it's pretty easy just to rack that up in front of the eyes. Look for large phorias, look for a receding near point of convergence. When doing a near point of convergence, more important than the findings is looking at the patient's face, looking for grimaces, binocular problems, etc. Patients who have a high phoria, but good virgins ability or good virgins adaptation may be asymptomatic and do not need to be treated. Patients with poor adaptation and a deviation may be treated with uh, prisms or vision therapy. Only treat symptomatic patients. If they're not symptomatic, don't. They're lenses, vision therapy, surgery, or we always can do nothing. Doing nothing doesn't make the condition any worse or better. If we just generally, if we leave things alone, one third get better, one third get worse, and one third stay about the same. Prisms will reduce the load on the fast virgin system, and they'll work very well whenever a patient does not have very good slow virgins. Vision therapy, it improves both fast and slow virgins so that the person is able to handle the stresses from their... And vision therapy is not building up muscle numbers like building up strength when you go to the gym. It has a permanent change and that it alters the reflexive nature of slow virgins. As we mentioned previously, patients who have poor virgins tend to have asthenopia. And this was shown in a very good study by uh, Henson and North. And when vision therapy was done, they showed that it improved prism adaptation and eliminated asthenopia. And we measure fast virgins with prisms. Slow virgins may be measured by the width of a fixation disparity curve, repeated cover testing, or just wearing a prism. The most common methodology is just watching the eyes with repeated. Patients with prism, patients who you want to correct with prism, the best method is to use Sheard's criteria, which is two times the Fourier minus the opposing deduction divided by three. For example, if we have a patient has 15 diopters of exophoria. X with the prime is exophoria at near. 2 times 15 is 30. The opposing induction is 15. 30 minus 15 is 15. Divided by 3 is 5 base in. Split it between the two eyes, 2 and a half base in. If we put that in front of the eyes, that will reduce the XO if there is no adaptation to 10 prism diopters, and it will artificially increase the base out because of the starting point has been changed to, f to 5, which will increase the base out range to 20. Now you've, you've met Sheard's criteria. When we prescribe PRISM for a vertical deviation, we usually try to balance off the deductions. Patients who are hyperopic, patients who have a high ACA ratio, we need to calculate the AC ratio, ACA ratio. Many of you have been taught the best way of doing it is to use a gradient test. And clearly, academically, that is correct. From a clinical standpoint, the best way of doing it is to measure distance near findings. The reason for that is because the distance near method gives us the amount of, amount of plus lens we need to eliminate or reduce the area of error of deviation at near. I'm not interested in its accuracy. I'm interested in its impact or its effect on the position of the eyes. We can, whenever we calculate an ACA ratio, make the assumption that the patient has a 60 PD. If you go through the math, you'll, you would quickly determine that if it's a 70 PD, that you're really not gonna make that much of a difference in the ultimate ACA ratio. So assume a 60 PD, assume 16 inches, and therefore you can do it in your head. And if you go from ortho to 16 inches, there's 15 diopters of convergence. That's take, determined by taking the PD 60 divided by 4, 
and that's 15 that's in meter angles um, by four meter angles and you get 15 prism diopters so let's take a patient who has who's orthophoric at distance and who's 10 of esophoria near right off the bat we know this patient has a high ACA ratio so if we go from ortho to 10 of ESO, we have 10 diopters of additional convergence, plus the 15, which is from ortho to near, that's 25, divided by 2.5, that's a 10 to 1 ACA ratio. The add should be 10 divided by 10 or plus 1. And if you have a distance deviation, then you need to add a little bit of prism. Another example. Let's say we had a patient who was 15 diopters of uh, ESO at distance, uh, aphoria, and 30 diopters of intermittent esotropia at near. And they had a plus one's psychoplegic refraction, and that was measured without prescription. So 15 of ESO to 30 of ESO represents a 15 diopter increase in ESO, plus the 15 is 30, 30 by, oh, divided by 2.5 is 12 to 1. So if we, if we prescribe the plus 1 at distance, that will eliminate 12 diopters of distance in near. So if we take that off of the distance, we land up having 3 of ESO at distance and 18 prism diopters of ESO at near. So if we want to get rid of the deviation totally, then we could prescribe three base outs split between the two eyes, combined with plus one at distance. So now we've got, th we've eliminated the three of ESO at distance. We've reduced the 18 of ESO at, at near to 15. So now if we want to get rid of the 15, then we can then add, put a one and a quarter at. This patient would need plus one, three base out with a what plus one and a quarter at, it would eliminate the deviation, get them basically aligned. That would be a wonderful starting point for vision therapy. Vision therapy would build up the fusional amplitudes. It would be a very uncomplicated case. The goal would be to eventually eliminate first the amount of prism that the patient needs, three base out not being a big amount and eventually to reduce the ad so that the patient could be put into bifocal contact lenses. The truth of the matter, in my experience, bifocal or multifocal soft lenses are not nearly as good as we would think in eliminating these types of deviation. And this is how that prescription would be written. If you remember, Hillary Clinton at one particular point had some type of episode occurring and afterwards, she stopped wearing her contact lenses and came out with glasses that look like this. Can you make a diagnosis by looking at the prism, the glasses? And what's your most presumptive diagnosis? It's kind of evident what she has. You can see by the thickness of the glasses that she has a left esotropia. It's most likely occurring at distance. They put the prism over one eye, so she most likely has a left esotropia due to a sixth nerve palsy. The deviation is greater at distance than near. It would have been better to have actually cut that prism in half, and it would have been a lot easier to, have to function. And she should have hidden this from the press and got it made up in a pair of uh, glasses that no one would have known that this had happened. But the other interesting or good thing, this is, you know, I find that most optometrists and most uh, neuro-ophthalmologists put a patch over these patients. It's wrong. So how would you uh, prescribe the prism? You need to measure both the horizontal and vertical deviation in a phoropter with a sensory method or with a prism, by, uh, prism method. Um, Use the minimum amount of prism that will eliminate deviation. Vertical component, two less than that. Vision therapy does not exclude the use of prism. I use prism all the time in my patients. 
patients who have binocular problems need to be relieved in the real world. A lot of times our goal in vision therapy is to eliminate the prismatic correction. I'm really kind of gearing these to the non-VT doctors um, because I think a lot of these problems, the majority of binocular problems can be handled with you in a non-vision therapy mechanism. They can be referred out depending on where you live or where you practice. Uh, you know, I hear oftentimes there's no one doing vision therapy for 100 miles. Um, then you have a responsibility and a role in trying to help those particular patients. Clearly, if you're not doing vision therapy and the patient needs it, then we need to refer these patients out. Our VT doctors got to be make sure that they get these patients back to you. They can't hold on to them. As a general rule, we need to improve monocular accommodative uh, rot to uh, plus 250 minus 6. We need to get fusional amplitudes to up to around 25 uh, base in and base out of 40. And if you do these types of things, the diagnosis is irrelevant. Let me make that statement again. If you can improve monocular accommodative rock up to plus 250 minus 6, base into 25 or 40, it doesn't make too much of a difference what type of deviation or what type of binocular problem they have. It will probably eliminate it. And we need to improve both voluntary and accommodative vergence. We've got to make it reflexive. You have to add distractors. So when we do some of the home vision therapy types of things, we tend to do it with a doing, particularly with convergence problems, push-ups, Brock string, and the home vision therapy program, which we'll talk about. Traditional vision therapy versus computer therapy. The problem with traditional therapy is that there's no control over the stimuli or the responses. You need to be able to alter or change therapy in response to the responses of the patient. Thus, the best way of doing this is with the implementation of random dot stereograms because there are no monocular cues. You can't, the concept of home therapy versus in-office therapy, clearly in-office therapy supplemented with home therapy is the most advantageous form of therapy. But with busy baby boomers uh, and millennium, and every other type of group, no one has any time to do in-office therapy. Insurance companies tend to, to cover vision therapy for convergence insufficiency, but do not cover it for uh, other forms of treatment, and therefore um, it makes it expensive to do. The impact of managed care insurance companies has made vision therapy harder for it to do. So we need to improve the effectiveness. We need to do it at home. There have been five studies uh, published which have shown the effectiveness of the home therapy system in optometry and vision development in uh, the previous journal of the American Optometric Association Optometry. Um, in BMC, British uh, Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, APOS, uh, and uh, those are the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Surgery. There were two articles in it that show that uh, home therapy based upon computer methodology is relatively effective. And these types of things can be used in the concussion or traumatic brain injury group. The key difference in doing this is that uh, you need to do vision therapy much slower. You have to be very slow in doing it. But um, uh, in, in a study by Conrad, Conrad Mitchell and Culp, they uh, demonstrated that uh, within 12 sessions, uh, there was an improvement in convergence, positive, positive fusional amplitudes, and there, there was an improvement in symptoms. So um, you can work with these patients in a home-based thing. Just go slowly. There are two models of the uh, home therapy system. One is called HTS. That's used by optometrists, which includes both saccadics pursuits and accommodative therapy. In the CVS system, 
there is no saccadic therapy, no accommodative therapy, because the ophthalmological or pediatric ophthalmological group does not believe in treatment of accommodation or in or, or ocular motility in that, okay? As I've mentioned before, I do have a, uh, a financial interest in this, um, and therefore uh, I'm a real advocate of it. The other home vision therapy systems can't be monitored at home. Don't change the virgin size of the stimuli. Don't have the same protocol and have not used in any, been used in any clinical trials to show their validity on that. So the keys on this is the re immediate reinforcement that's given. The therapy is based upon the patient's success and changes. There's motivation that's encouraged by the per person's graph, uh, and they tend to improve. So the treatment actually finds a automated sequential portion in which first they build up virgence amplitudes, then we do it with large targets, we go to smaller targets, then we go to an auto slide program where the targets are going back and forth at a variable speed, and then step or jump duction activities. Uh, in the very beginning, we, we, we tell the patients to do these tests in, in a quiet room without anything bothering you, but um, we really want the patients to land up being able to do this while they're being distracted either by um, their friends talking, by moving their heads, anything they can possibly do. We want to make it reflexive in nature. This is uh, quite good for anyone who cannot participate in office therapy, and the patients must be able to perceive a random dot stereogram. This is not a system that will work with any patient with a constant strabismus, okay? And the beauty of it, as we mentioned before, is that we get out printouts. We can see the performance per session, uh, the amount of time that they're doing it. You can see this either having the patient print it out or viewing it at uh, having your technician view it. It's really good from that standpoint. Gives reinforcement back on that. Uh, this is the um, this is the table of contents of the of the program and allows you to make a determination of what you want to do. And you can see when the patients have done it. You can see that on the September 19th, it wasn't done. In August, the patient started. They didn't do it for a while, uh, and they've been skipping around a little bit. So showing them that you're watching over clearly improves it. You can send them little notes telling them, hey, you're doing a good job. Keep up the good work. Uh, you can change the, uh, the the motor program, the effects on it. Um, there's lots of really good things you can do on this. You can do it vertical. You can do it horizontal. Um, you can do just base out. You can do just base in. But to make this a little bit more like a real good in-office therapy, we believe that you need to add push-ups. Brock string, particularly the concept of bug on the string. You need to add distractors moving in and out, side to side, carry on a conversation with the patient. Bug on the string is doing a Brock string, making believe that there's a bug walking up the string. So the patient is making voluntary vergence along that string, having them stop the bug, having them make the bug go back two inches, come back closer three inches, etc. Building up this whole concept of voluntary uh, vergence. Who should you treat? You should treat skills cases. They're 80% of a vision therapy uh, practice. Welcome to the second hour in which we're going to talk about strabismic deviations, both paralytic and non-paralytic, and other syndromes which are strabismic. Let's just start off with the non-paralytic ones, where we have a deviation at distance and at near, and that the deviations are somewhat concomitant. This can be broken down via ACA ratio by esotropia, exotropia um, for the horizontal ones. And uh, that includes divergence insufficiency where the ACA is low. We have a large ESO or a larger ESO at distance than we do at near. Thus, plus lenses are going to have a minimal effect. Basic where there's a normal ACA. The deviation of ESO is similar at both distance and near. And convergence excess, where the ACA is high 
and that the uh, plus lenses will have a major impact in near. In the area of excitropia, divergence excesses has been presumed to have a high ACA, but we'll talk about it really as a normal ACA. There are other factors which uh, make it look like the ACA ratio is high. Basic exotropia, the deviation is similar distance and near, and convergence insufficiency, low ACA, very responsive to vision therapy or orthoptics, um, possibly prism in which plus lenses will have a minimum role. It is always important to differentiate the etiology of the esotropia, particularly is it new or old, that can be done by history, photo review, and most importantly, if there's an associated diplopia or not. As a general rule, any patient who has a deviation and does not experience diplopia, it's an old deviation. The older deviations are clearly more related to cosmesis and not related to an abrupt new eye disease or pathology neurological in nature. The, the real reason that most patients seek to correct their deviation is number one is cosmetic, number two is because they have diplopia because it's new and onset. However, there is a group that want binocular vision. As a general rule, the earlier the deviation began, the greater the impact on the cortical disparity cells and the reduced chance of attaining normal binocular vision. With that said, it is clearly evident that head, that there is the possibility of reestablishing binocular vision in some people who have early onset infantile or congenital types of deviations. Most concomitant esotropia is not due to involvement of the third, fourth, or sixth nerve. They're further up in the brain. They're in the supranuclear area. And we need to, if it's new and onset, rule out cranial lesions, MS, aneurysms, any type of bleed, um, and this is obviously done with MRI. If you're very, if it's really new and nonsense, and you're very concerned, it should be done with contrast. Always keep in mind that uh, Lyme disease is the great mimicker, and any if you live in a Lyme disease area, you need to get a Lyme disease titer. And the other one that is that often will masquerade. Uh, the cause is myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis usually produces a non-concomitant deviation, one that does not match a third, fourth, or sixth nerve uh, deviation, and, um, and it usually is variable in time. With that said, it doesn't have to do that. If we have a recent onset uh, esotropia with diplopia, and we believe that this is not going to be permanent, uh, the best treatment is the application of Fresnel prisms, and the amount should be just the amount that will eliminate the deviation applied over one eye. Except in the case of third nerve palsies, I almost never patch. My aim is to restore binocular vision and functioning, even if these patients have their deviations for a short period of time of three to four months. A more permanent solution is surgery. We usually wait six months. Um, and there's always the um, treatment of doing nothing. Um, most patients, however, want to do something to obtain normal binocular vision. On the other hand, older concomitant deviations are clearly non-pathological in nature. If the deviation is uh, significant in size, particularly in esotropia, uh, consider surgery. Uh, these patients, oftentimes we uh, combine surgery with PRISM. The determination of binocularity can be assessed after surgery. We clearly make sure these patients have normal retinal correspondence before instituting any type of fusion treatment. In my experience, ARC is very difficult to ameliorate, and uh, usually if it's very embedded, particularly after surgery, we kind of leave these patients alone. The uh, risk of uh, irretractable diplopia is too 
high. Interesting exotropia compared to esotropia is rarely pathological. The majority of exotropes are intermittent. 95% of divergence excess basic or CI are intermittent. True constant uh, deviations are problematic since they do not have any uh, binocular disparity cells or the ability to achieve binocular vision. Again, the most important thing is to see if the patient can have diplopia, um, intermittent exotropia. Uh, usually, the divergence excess types do not have diplopia, while convergence insufficiency type do have diplopia, particularly when they decompensate. They're relatively concomitant, often associated with overaction of the inferior oblique or uh, a V syndrome, um, which is non-pathological in nature. The second group are those that are paralytic in nature. And uh, we can think of these as being either complete, where there is a paralysis. So you'll be able to see this on ductions, one eye movement, or when there's a paresis which is relative to each eye's input, so that if we do a version, we will see that the patient is non-commonant. So we, wanted the, we want to do two types of eye movements, versions, which is the first type, it will pick up both paresis and paralysis, and ductions to differentiate if there is a paralysis there. If, if a version is normal, there is no need to uh, do ductions of each one of the eyes. The key thing in true paralytic devi deviations is that in primary gaze at either distance or at near, there is a deviation. Let me repeat that. In a true paralytic deviation, there's a deviation in primary gaze either at distance, near, or in both. And it's important to differentiate if it's new or, or old. Most paralytic deviations are non-concomitant. They may get some spread of concomitancy when they've been around a long period of time, and they can be rated on the basis of being mild, which is six to 10 diopters of deviation and from one gaze to another, moderate 11 to 15, 16 to 20 is marked, and 4 plus if they're very, very large. The reality is, in this particular situation, if you ask me to be able to name these numbers, I wouldn't be able to. Just keep this as a guide if you're uncomfortable with it, um, but if you've seen a number of these patients, you can do it just by looking at it. And whenever we evaluate these patients, go right from the front of the eye, optical being induced by anisometropia, Cornea, keratoconus creating monocular, artificial, or pseudodiplopia. Uh, the same thing can happen in the lens, rarely at the retinal level. And as we go further back, it's at the neuromuscular junction. Is it happening at the muscle itself? Is it happening within the orbital uh, apex? Or is this happening along the nerve, nucleus, higher up? Uh, supranuclear areas. So we're always looking to try to determine where the etiology is so that we can start thinking about it. The most common causes in nerve impairment are vascular in, in nature. Tumor is less common in young children, more viral in nature. It theoretically it can be due to a faulty insertion. This is relatively rare adhesions like Brown's uh, syndrome, uh, ligament abnormalities, um, neuromuscular junction, the uh, key on this particular one is myasthenia gravis. How do we evaluate these particular patients? Well, the first thing to do is just to do a simple version on them, cover test at distance, cover test at near, always do it in the primary position do not do your measurement in inferior gaze up close because that's going to uh, be tainted by V types of syndromes. Um, if there's an abnormal version, do adduction to determine if there's any abnormality on monocular. And when we do find an abnormality in cover test, measure it. 
I'm going to keep repeating it, measure it with the prism bar. These should not be just called exotropy, esotropy. They should have measurements. And they should have measurements in the nine positions of gaze to determine concomitancy. It's good to do this, A, to make the diagnosis, B, to help us determine the amount of prism and see if for legal uh, uh, management and to be able to determine if it's changing over a period of time. Without the measurements, you can't really make those types of things. These are called motor fields when we go into the different diagnostic directions. I typically do it with a prism bar, and, and when I do it at distance, I use, I'm in a fairly small room, so I turn the patient's head into each one of these positions. It really takes me a couple of minutes. Also, you can use the computer or orthopter. It has a motor fields built into it. If a patient um, is not seeing double, this often can be elicited with a red lens. I remember that uh, if we turn an eye in, uh, diplopia is based upon where it hits the retina. In this particular case, we have two different, we have one stimulus hitting two different positions on the retina uh, because of the deviation. And in the case of esotropia, the, uh, the image hits the nasal portion of the retina and is projected temporally. In exo, we have cross diplopia because in the exotropic patient, it's going to hit the temporal portion of the retina and be projected nasally. This is the typical finding that you're going to have when you chart a patient who has a right superior oblique, particularly if it's typical and they have some overaction of the inferior oblique. And if you look at this, this quickly gives you a uh, idea of the amount of um, prism that you need to eliminate the deviation. You can see that if you prescribe um, uh, approximately three diopters of right hyper, that will be in the range to be able to maintain binocularity and inferior gaze where we read, and it will neutralize most of the areas of deviation on it. We can also use a Maddox rod, and the Maddox rod has the advantages that it will pick up a cyclo deviation. Just keep in mind as we go through these that the uh, in, in looking at eye muscles, that the orbits uh, tend to go, they tend to go in an outward direction. Therefore, the recti muscles tend to go 23 degrees um, outwards, where the obliques come in from uh, 90 degrees away from it, and therefore are going to be more prominent during adduction. It's going to be the rectus during abduction and the oblique during adduction of the eyes. <clears throat> Let's first talk about overactions. Um, overactions can occur during paresis, and it's due that one of, that we get an over response when the paretic muscle is trying to fixate, and uh, therefore we will have a difference between primary gaze when the sound eye is fixating versus the paretic eye that is fixating. You know, at first you think that this is an academic issue. It is not, and the reason why it is not is because of the fact that if a patient has involvement of the paretic muscle, the has, has macular involvement or visual acuity involvement of the eye that has a paresis, you'll get an overaction, a larger uh, deviation. And when you correct these patients with prisms, you have to, have to take that into account. You have to correct the eye that has uh, a paretic uh, deviation. So in this particular case, we have a patient with a right sixth nerve palsy, and in the top uh, panel, you can see that the right eye is turned in, probably about 15, 20 diopters, but in the lower panel, when the right eye is forced to uh, fixate, the left eye turns in um, approximately 30 to 35 prism diopters. It's been talked about that there are stages of paresis. The first thing is that there's weakness of the muscle. Second is overaction of the ipsilateral antagonist. The most common situation for this is a uh, superior oblique palsy, and there's overaction of the ipsilateral antagonist. And then over a period of time, you get contracture. And these changes occur within a few days or a few weeks. 
There are complaints of diplopia. And as we mentioned before, always make sure there's no astigmatism. This is one of the most common causes of it. Because of contracture and overaction, the deviation becomes more concomitant. Therefore, the deviation has approximately the same angle in the nine positions of gaze. When we have contracture, we have increased resistance of the muscle and stretching of it. And there's actually some loss of elasticity and hyalinization, and it becomes permanent in nature. If you walk into an emergency room or hospital, order of frequency is sixth, third, and fourth. However, in a optometric, ophthalmological setting, it's the opposite being fourth, fourth being the most common. Most of these decompensation of old fourth nerves, sixth next, happily third are the least common. Um, because the third nerves are the hardest ones to handle. Let's start talking about the, that most common one, superior oblique palsy. When a patient has a right superior oblique palsy, uh, there, there seem to be three stages. In the first stage, the muscle is affected, and this is the classical way that you learn, meaning that the deviation is going to be greatest in the field of action of that muscle, in the case of the superior oblique, it's down and in. In actuality, you almost only see that in very recent superior oblique palsies, particularly those that are due to trauma. In the more common ones, which are decompensation of a congenital fourth nerve palsy, we tend to see um, either the situation where there's a contracture of the inferior oblique, and the deviation is greatest on adduction, but similar on elevation and depression. Or we see the third panel in which there is overaction of the inferior oblique, and thus the, the deviation in down gaze is kind of masked or overridden by the massive response of the overaction. This is the most common response. This panel, put it in your brains because this is the co most common appearance of an old inferior oblique palsy. And this exaggeration of the inferior oblique kind of does what I call a windshield wiper. Think of the win old fashioned windshield wipers that used to go from in to out. So as you take your hands and you move them out, you get elevation, you get abduction going out, and you get X cyclotorsion going out. So your up and out should be what you keep thinking about with the inferior oblique. And actually, this is the only muscle you really need to know its action of because all the other ones are kind of inherent and, uh, and don't have much regard to Park's three-step method. This is a pictorial representation of classic overaction of the inferior oblique. Um, I-O-O-A for inferior oblique overaction. And you can see in this particular case, the right eye is shooting up. If you look at panel one, um, adduction is minimal. Two, it's increased with elevation. And then if you look at the fourth panel, you have uh, the eye going out and up. This is the classic uh, example of a patient who has a left uh, superior oblique palsy. If you look at the center uh, panel, the left eye is vertical. And if you look at the, um, the top panels, the one to your right, it's hard to see any vertical deviation. Look all the way over to the left. You can see that the left eye is both up and out. And if you look in down the down panels, it's very difficult to even see the deviation in that particular case. This is a classic left superior oblique palsy with the overaction of the inferior oblique masking the deviation. So we've all been taught to do a Parks three step like this is a difficult type of thing. And it's really kind of done kind of fast. Here's a patient who uh, on primary gaze has a little bit of a uh, right uh, hypertropia, easily seen in the lower panel. On the basis of the cover testing in the right uh, hyper, we're left with four muscles 
uh, right superior oblique, left superior rectus, rect inferior rectus, and then left inferior oblique. You don't really need to remember these. So if we now do a version to the right or the left, it will isolate it down laterally. Think about what's happening with in this particular case, that in step two, that the person, if they're the right eye, if they move their eyes and look to their right, it's either going to be the rectus of the right eye or it's going to be oblique of the left eye. If they adduct the eye, it's going to be just the opposite. It's going to be either an oblique of the right eye or a rectus of the left eye just because of the position of the way the orbits tend to go out. Uh, in the classic superior oblique, the deviation is going to increase on adduction. The last portion of it is a Bilchowski head tilt. And in, and this is pretty easy. You can do these all in two seconds. You get a child who comes in. Um, you do a cover test. You see that they have a right superior rectus. Turn their, because you know it's probably going to be a, an oblique. You turn their head to their right shoulder. It's going to increase. Tilt their head back to the right right side and you're going to see that the eye goes up. So it's pretty quick on that to be able to make a determination of this deviation. You don't have to do this fancy three-step methodology. All you have to do is turn around, have them looking straight ahead, determine in primary gaze, turn the head so that they will have to adduct their eye, see an elevation on it, turn their head to the same side shoulder and see an elevation. You've done all three tests. I do that all the time in a, uh, a, a young child. And you might want to remember this mnemonic, so or, same side, oblique, opposite side, rectus. This is a uh, schematic to de depict it, and it shows you what happens in the eyes if on, on inducing that. Look at this little baby, okay? You see the baby having a head tilt. If you straighten the head of the baby's head out, okay, then as soon as you straighten the head out, you're going to see that the right eye elevates. Tilt it more to the right shoulder. You see that it elevates even more. Turn the baby's head to the right, and you'll see that the deviation is greater. Do it that quickly. You've done the three steps and you know which muscle it is. Here's another example of a patient with a right hyper. Note that when the person looks to their left, or then when they adduct the eye, you have an increase in elevation. And when we tilt the head to the left, there's almost no deviation, and when we tilt it to the right, the eye goes up. So we can do this very rapidly in one quick tilt. And um, this is a patient of mine who had a left superior oblique palsy. And the nice thing about it, if you look at the top panel, you can see the grimacing of her head. Uh, and when you look at the lower one where she's not, where she's binocular, life is good without the grimacing. In this particular one, look look at her forehead, look at the muscles and how hard she's working to keep the eyes straight. Notice the head tilt to maintain binocularity. And she has a single binocular vision in this particular area. We can, we can change that field by either doing vision therapy to expand it by putting prism in there to elevate it and make it larger or referring to a good surgeon who will weaken the inferior oblique in this particular case and extend binocular vision. Um, fairly large deviations. They do a good job in surgery. Don't, don't pass this away. So again, last, right hyper, okay? Horizontal and then with the head tilt. This checking and chaining, uh, I'm gonna go through it very rapidly. I hate it. They teach you to circle it. It's no understanding of it. And you just got to kind of remember it. If you do it the other way that we just talked about, you'll never forget it. So if we have a recent onset superior oblique, we're going to get vertical diplopia. The deviation is going to be greatest down and in. Uh, if you go and look at their old pictures, they're going to be normal. Uh, 
And if you put a patch over their head, they'll get rid of their tilt. This is an interesting one. Okay, in a recent one, the absolute value of the vertical de of the vertical ductions has been maintained, or it's around three diopters or so. A patient with a old superior oblique palsy will have very large vertical fusional amplitudes due to the abundant slow vergence that is holding the eye straight. In a recent one, you need full prism. And it may or may not work depending on how much torsion is present. Over a period of time, and, and really within a short period of time, there's contracture, there can be overaction, and you get a spread of con concomitants. So if you have a new superior oblique, what's the most common cause of it? If it's not traumatic in nature, diabetic, you always have to rule out giant cell arteritis in these patients. Get a sed rate in the, uh, and get a physical examination on them. If you have an isolated superior oblique, no other neurological involvement, uh, you can get an MRI. Uh, the primary care guys are going to get an MRI. Uh, Neuro-ophthalmologists may or may not get an MRI, uh, but they clearly can be watched. They're, they're really pretty benign on that. So we need to differentiate between the old ones and the new ones. And the last one's a skewed deviation. A skewed deviation is a relatively concomitant vertical deviation that defies Park's three-step method meaning that if you do a Parks three-step method, you are not going to get an increase in deviation on eye adduction or a change on tilting the head. Thus, these particular patients need to have a real uh, MRI or, or, uh, neuro, or neuro-ophthalmological evaluation. Primary overaction, the inferior oblique, key on that. No deviation in primary gaze. Remember what we said. A true paralytic deviation always has a deviation in primary gaze. Happily, the most common superior oblique palsies are old decompensated ones. They may or may not be concomitant. When you review pictures, you're going to see abnormal head positions in it. There'll be no change with occlusion. Uh, and there'll be abnormal vertical ductions on it. The old ones only need a small amount of prism. And the, one of the keys, look at the face of an old patient with a superior oblique palsy. 76% of them have some facial asymmetry so that it's a giveaway and it may not be true paresis as we've always been taught. One, one of the things that's interesting is on binocular indirect, both old and new show some form of torsion. However, the um, old ones do not have a cyclo deviation me measured on the Maddox rod, but the new ones do. Uh, it's really not necessary if they're congenital. They're non-progressive as far as the deviation goes, even though binocularity may be affected. You want to give the minimum amount of prism that will hold their eyes together. If they're asymptomatic, don't give them any prism. Uh, we often do vision therapy on these patients. Interestingly, we, we do not train the verticals. We train horizontals. And surgery is very effective. Newly acquired one, try some prism. Uh, the cyclo might make it tough. Determine the etiology. These patients may need surgery at the end. Bilateral fourth, rare. Uh, these are all traumatic in nature. It, this will give a cyclo uh, in both directions. Truth of the matter is I've never seen one, okay? Almost always due to a car accident. These are, these are tough. If you do see them, they have to have surgery on both muscles, otherwise you'll do one eye and you're going to have a problem with it. 
As we mentioned before, we need to differentiate these from a inferior oblique. Um, the key in a, in a primary inferior oblique overaction is there's no deviation in primary gaze, no cyclodeviation. You can't do a Parks three-step method on it. Uh, the treatment of that is either weakening of the inferior oblique. Some of these patients have pure horizontal diplopia in superior gaze, and they can be trained to overcome it with vision therapy. So those are the two methods of treatment, non-pathological, nothing to worry about. We talked about the skew deviation previously. They're basically concomitant. Key, Parks 3-step will not work. Must have a neurological evaluation. Sixth nerve palsy. Not, not uncommon. I see a number of these. Almost always, they're ischemic in nature. Uh, deviation, you can almost make it from the chair. Patient is complaining of horizontal double vision when they drive, when they look at distance. Reading is okay. If they look to the right, that means it's a sixth nerve to on the right side. If the deviation increases upon looking to the right, it's a right sixth nerve palsy. If it increases upon looking to the left, it's a left sixth nerve palsy. Real easy. Most of these patients have a 20 diopter deviation. Keep that in mind, okay? Because that's about what we're going to need in prism. Classic one over here is that you can see in the top panel, the patient cannot abduct the eye. Um, in this particular case, the person is fixating in the middle panel. In this particular case, this patient has a right sixth nerve palsy. And you can see when the person um, in the top panel tries to abduct their eye, it does not occur. Deviation is quite large. In the center panel, the, uh, uh, the, the patient is fixating with the paretic eye. Um, and when they move to the left uh, position, there is no evidence of a deviation. This person uh, had a sudden uh, sixth nerve palsy. When we looked at the back of the eye, uh, this patient was found to have uncontrolled diabetes, worse than the right eye and the left eye. And that's the reason why they fixated with the opposite eye. Um, and uh, it's not hard to understand what needed to be done with this particular patient. If a patient does not have obvious diabetes, uh, you, need, you need to really take a look, make sure that they're not diabetic. Get a SED rate. If they're in Lyme territory, get a VDRL and a Lyme titer. Uh, myasthenia gravis antibody tests are helpful in that area. Physical examination. If there's more than one muscle involved, get the patient out of the office, get them to a neurologist. That's someone you should not take care of. All of the ones that we're talking about are relatively simple things that a primary care optometrist should be able to take care of in their office. If they're diabetic, put a Fresno prism over the affected eye. Um, will probably resolve in two to, between two and four months of time. And the key in this particular one, it's not the muscle that's affected. It's the um, myelinated nerve fibers that have broken because of the ischemic attack. And when the myelination regenerates, the deviation will disappear. Um, this is where botulitum came out, Botox. Botox was actually developed to take care of six nerve palsies. Sure, went a different way, didn't it? Third nerve palsies, we've heard that all the time. Key is, is there pupillary sparing or not? Patients with pupillary sparing, um, need to be watched in the first week. Those are generally diabetic in nature. Happily, the only ones that I've ever seen have been diabetic in nature. I've never seen one with an aneurysm, but you would sure need to make sure you don't miss that particular patient because the end result is not a happy event if you miss it. So uh, even if pupillary sparing doesn't come in the first week, 
watch these patients. These are kind of tough to take care of. The, happily, the, uh, the lid comes down, includes the eye, and eliminates the diplopia, so you don't have to do much to get them out of trouble. But the care of a third nerve palsy that doesn't resolve, real tough case surgically, real tough to do it. Fortunately, they don't happen very, very often. Thyroid is a condition you got to keep your mind out for all the time. Look, when you walk into an exam room, always look at your patient. Always look to see if they're red, see if they're protruded, see where the lid position is. The exam begins when you walk into the patient. I'm always thinking of that. I always see the students. They don't really observe the patients, and they miss this subtle type of deviation. The first thing that happens with thyroid condition is the development of a mild convergence insufficiency. That happens before the palsies. Those are oftentimes asthenopic. Respond to convergence hypotherapy. Once they go to a more advanced thyroid condition, the most common muscle that's involved is the inferior rect and it causes a failure of elevation because the fibrotic changes of the muscle. Classic look, look at those, you know, the lid retraction of those patients, the scleral exposure, the exophthalmus in the patients. Look at your patients. You should be able to see them as soon as they come in because of that look, either this way or a little bit less exaggerated. And this instrument. A Hertel exophthalmometer is a key in our office. We have two or three of these in, in each one of the offices. You need to get a baseline measurement. Once you have measured the eye's position, in this particular case it's set at 106, you need to always measure them from that position, even if you measured them from the wrong base in the beginning. It's the only way that you can compare it. They always talk about doing forced ductions. There's some people who talk about doing it with a Q-tip. Don't do it with a Q-tip. You'll run that Q-tip right off their cornea, take off of their epithelium, and you'll have a you know, corneal abrasion. Um, if you're going to do a forced duction, you got to do it and tell them that they're going to get a subconjunctival hemorrhage, and you got to use uh, teeth forceps to be able to move the eye into the position. So generally, most people don't do that, meaning the optometrists or even ophthalmologists, but you got to do it with force forceps. Do not do it as some people who advocate with a Q-tip. just doesn't work from that particular standpoint. This is a patient that I examined. This was familiar protrusion of their eyes with exposure. This patient did not have Graves' disease. You needed to watch her for a dry eye, though. Another classical one. These patients should get an MRI. It's, you know, because you're looking at soft tissue. And it's pretty easy for anyone, even a neophyte, to see that in this particular case, the medial rectus, the medial rectus is very enlarged. Again, initial stages of patients are that, that uh, some movement of the eyes to some EOM therapy. They may have a convergence insufficiency. Treatments include systemic steroids, uh, radiation of the orbit, or decompression of the orbit. Um, I've seen some really wonderful results with uh, radiation of the orbit, um, particularly in patients who have failed with decompression. decompression. Myasthenia gravis has got to be one of the most missed types of things that walk into an optometric and ophthalmological practice. Though considered to be relatively rare, I've seen a number of them, um, and uh, they tend to be a little bit more common in women. The women tend to have more early on age, 28 years of age. Um, you've heard a number of things about the, uh, the functioning of this. And that it's an autoimmune disease, that it basically is uh, most often diagnosed because of an increasing ptosis that uh, increases as the day goes on. Uh, however, however, 
Many of these will first present with a um, diplopia. Any patient with new sudden onset diplopia, you need to consider them. If you have a patient who does have myasthenia, you need to uh, rule out a thymoma. You need to get a CAT scan on them. Uh, when you get myasthenia, they're either, take that back, patients with myasthenia either have those that just affect the eyes or affect the whole body. Um, the presentation of myasthenia 90% of the time is with ocular symptoms. Over a two-year period of time, these tend to progress to uh, systemic in about 50% of your patients. Key, the patients will have some breathing or swallowing problems. And sometimes you'll hear almost like a wheeze that's coming from their voice when they're talking. There's, there's almost a, a myesthetic sound to it. Key in the differential diagnosis in the early stages is ocular fatigue. This means that the deviation or the ptosis tends to occur upon utilization worse in the evening than the morning. There are some reverse ones that get it the other way around. But most often notice as the day goes on. Myasthenics can have an involvement of ptosis, strabismus, accommodation, or in their saccadics. Rarely pupil changes. The main reason why the eyes are affected because the muscles have a higher discharge rate. Um, the, the typical myasthenic patient has a ptosis that increases at the end of the day. It increases after your sustained convergence. You can keep looking up and down that the, that the eye will overshoot in that particular situation. This one I like, okay? You have a patient with the ptosis in the right eye. You pick up the right eye's lid. What happens? The left eye goes down, okay? So it's, uh, it's fairly dramatic when you see it. Very positive, but they're not done that much at this particular point because there are other ways of doing it. Just keep in mind that anytime you get something that's that's variable, it's non-predictable, you got to think about my then you. Rarely the first signs of, a con of a myasthenia can be accommodation. This is not reported frequently in the literature. How do you make the diagnosis? Number one is fatigue, tensilon. These are the ones that I really like, the ice pack test. And um, the ones I like is an ice pack test and I combine it with sleep or fatigue. I tend to take pictures in the morning, have the patient take pictures in the morning, take pictures at about eight o'clock at night, and then close their eyes, put ice on top of their eyes, close them for around 20 minutes and take another picture. Uh, and anytime you suspect it, uh, get either a single fiber myogram or antibody test. Tensilon is uh, done with 10 cc's of atropine. The old way used to be of, um, of injecting uh, a large amount of tensilon. Now it's done slowly to reduce the uh, chances of, of uh, any type of reaction. Not very often done in, at this particular point. I love this one. Most myasthenics can, can close their eyes, but they're easily pried open. Do this all the time. So have them squeeze real tight and try to pry their eyes open. In the myasthenic patient, they're going to open up real, real easy. The other uh, simple test to do is a sleep test, 30 minutes of sleep, 30 minutes of closing their eyes. When uh, they open their eyes, the ptosis disappears. Put some ice on top of it. It even makes it more sensitive. If they have a concomitant deviation, you can do PRISM with them. Um, I was taught about ptosis crutches in 1971. I've never done them. They're often treated with mesoton. Uh, prednisone is really the thing that's, that's really great. Look at that. Complete remission in 40 to 80% of them. Um, partial in 30%. Most of these patients are not on long-term prednisone but it really works in a lot of them. 
Mobius, this is for academic purposes. I've seen one or two of these patients, and they've been patients who have been referred to me. Very uncommon, very uncommon. Uh, they're, 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 they're noted by their facial expression. And they have retardation, their eyes, they don't blink properly, lots of problems with, um, with, with their corneas. Uh, they can be surgically made to look better. They're not going to develop any type of normal binocular vision. Other ones you need to keep in mind. Patients after cataract surgery. It can be due to the nesometropia, decompensation with the old superior oblique, fourier or thyroid. It can also be to the muscles being damaged, particularly by a bolus of anesthetic when, when a paraorbital anesthetic is used. Remember, they can be retrobulbar, which they put the anesthetic all the way back, paraorbital, where they put it on the side of the muscle. That's the one that can cause some real problems. And um, this is an example of a patient that I had. She was 75 years of age. She had uh, uh, theoretically uneventful cataract uh, operation. She developed diplopia right after surgery. She was diagnosed by, incorrectly diagnosed by a neuro-ophthalmologist of having superior oblique of the other eye. Um, she was referred for a prism evaluation. It was actually a palsy secondary to the anesthesia, uh, and that was determined by a Park's three-step method. Applied the prism. They do not get better with time. These are permanent insult to the muscles. Uh, so prism is usually the treatment. Most of these patients are going to wear some form of glasses, and the utilization of treatment is not a big problem for them. Patients who have had uh, retinal detachment surgery may develop diplopia. If they have developed diplopia, amazingly, many of them spontaneously will uh, uh, have the diplopia go away over a period of time. It uh, resolves itself. So the temporary diplopia, don't even worry about it. If it's more permanent, think of prismatic uh, uh, treatment. Um, if it's too large then consider surgery. Let's finish this up with some A syndrome and V syndrome. In an A syndrome patient, the deviation is greatest in inferior gaze. This person is going to have problems reading, going to need vision therapy, uh, or something to be able to get them binocular. DVD. Dissociated vertical deviations. These are either eye goes up on a cover test associated with congenital esotropia. Happily with just time, they tend to get a little bit better. Uh, so there's no uh, real treatment. Because if you think about it, you'd have to either put prism on, or under both eyes. You'd have to do surgery in both eyes. Uh, but they do get better over a period of time. Don't do anything with these particular patients. Just leave them alone. Here's a classic one where the right eye goes up with left eye fixating. Left eye goes up with right eye fixating. They can be either intermittent or they can be constant. They never, never develop normal binocular vision. Duane syndrome, which is common, it looks like a sixth nerve palsy. It's most common in females, usually unilateral, can be bilateral. Uh, when they're aligned, they have stereopsis on them. Unless they have a cosmetic problem, they should not be touched. They may have a concomitant um, um, convergence insufficiency, which can be treated. They were originally thought to be due to fibrosis of the extraocular muscle. The current thought is it's co-contraction of both the uh, of the medial rectus and lateral rectus muscle because of the absence of a sixth nerve. Um, this this is based upon an autopsy of one person, so it's a little difficult to generalize the way it's done. But we now divide Duane's into three different types. The classic one where there's absence of abduction of, of the eye so that, uh, that it looks like a sixth nerve palsy. 
The second one is there's an absence of adduction, so it looks like there's a medial rectus palsy, which by itself would make it a partial third, which is very unusual, or the combination of the two of them. In any case, they do, nothing needs to be done. This is a typical type 1 uh, Dwayne's. It is uh, easy to see in primary gaze, the person is straight. Upon uh, dextro uh, version, uh, the patient um, has uh, retraction of the palpebral fissures and of the eyeball. And on, uh, on uh, abduction, you can see that there is limitation of the eye movement with the eye becoming, uh, the lids opening up. This is a case of a bilateral Duane's. Notice the limitation in abduction and adduction and restriction. This is a patient of mine now who is an orthopedic surgeon. And as you can see, she just uses a head tilt to get herself binocular. This is a, another one of a type 2 Duane's. Take that one out. Do nothing. Treat the convergence insufficiency. If you treat the convergence insufficiency, do not break out the suppression mechanisms of these patients. Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, uh, relatively uncommon. Looks like a medial rectus paresis on adduction. There is uh, nystagmus, involvement of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. Get an MRI in these patients, it's often associated with, with MS. Rarely, if they're unilateral, that they can be an infarct of the basilar artery. MRIs. This is a patient of mine who had an inferior uh, INO. Notice the limitation of adduction, and she had adduction. Patient had normal convergence. Brown syndrome, patient key. Patient is straight in primary gaze and there's a failure to elevate the eye. No vertical deviation. It looks like an inferior oblique palsy. Um, it's been thought to be an abnormal uh, tendon. Sometimes you can hear a click on those. They're usually congenital, rarely post-inflammatory in nature. Do nothing. That's the key thing. Don't these patients shouldn't really be touched. Um, Surgery is not infected, and you're just going to make them worse. Blowout fracture. I think the key thing that you need to know: they're going to be seen in the emergency room. They're going to get the antibiotic treatments. They shouldn't blow their nose. Uh, the first week tells all. Uh, you should let the swelling and everything go down before they're treated. They should only be treated if they have diplopia and if the eye um, tends to uh, retract and become a cosmetic or binocular type of problem. We just went through all of binocular problems in two hours. Hopefully this has stimulated your thought, re-reviews binocular and muscle problems, and makes you feel more comfortable. Thank you for your time. Anyone have any questions?